I'll be sharing with you our experience in developing and implementing culturally tailored communication uh, model with, uh, with, the fa with the family and, and patients. So I'm going to mention, you know, why do we need uh, patients' family involved and why culturally based a model of family involvement is needed and mention our proposed uh, mo model to try to describe it to you and then uh, describe our uh, experience in implementing the model. So, so, so why do we need family involvement? Family provide actually relevant information to better understand the patient condition. They contribute to the decision making and they help healthcare provider um, and team care for the patient in the hospital and helping in home care. And of course, you know, this is important to fulfill societal expectation. So by providing the information, you know, patients, you know, may be overwhelmed and in denial or, or non-cooperative. Uh, patients may have mental status changes, memory problems, uh, or on medication or in pain. Um, and the family member observation may be totally different than, than the patient's, you know, uh, you know uh, side of the story because they'll be seeing it from a different angle and seeing it from outside. So, so that's why the, the information that you obtain from the family and, and the patient condition is critical. Uh, helping caring for the patients in the hospital, uh, you know, in, in, in many countries they may not allow that, you know, for the patients to stay for the patient's family to stay with the patients, but in certain circumstances, they, they do and they allow, and, and the family member may act as a sitter, may escort the patients within uh, the hospital and uh, observe the patients and so on. And that helped tremendously in facilitating discharge planning. Um, of course, at home, they are 24 hours with the patient, so they can provide uh, the care at home, which is very critical. Um, and, and therefore they help in the uh, compliance with the treatment and appointment and so on. And of course they observe the response in the treatment and detect early deterioration and, and, call, and call for help or bring the patients in. So now, you know, the society across the world, is, the expectation is changing, especially you know, with the era of the social media now, you know, if you look at Saudi Arabia in, in, in two, three months, I think the tweets, the number of tweets, almost 50 million tweets. And anything that happens in Saudi Arabia, you find it on Twitters and people interact with it very quickly and rapidly. Um, so the social media now make the plane flat and, and people can access information, share information, rightly or wrongly, uh, and set up the expectation of the society and the pulse of the street, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a very, uh, very dynamic way, and, and one has to be aware of it and, and take it into consideration. And of course, litigation is a very important component, albeit in, in some countries are much less than others, some societies are less litigious than others, but still, um, this is um, uh, an increasing phenomena across the board. And actually, in our experience, and when I look at all the complaints that we see, whether in a patient's practice committee, whether lawsuits or something like that, all come from family members. I rarely, one out of 10 or less, the patients himself complain. The family members usually complain on behalf of the patients. So, there are a lot of benefits, as you all aware, of patient-centered care. Uh, you, know, it, uh, you, know, it, you know, this is just some of it about increasing the satisfaction of staff, staff uh, and family and patients, because the staff, when there's a family-centered care, patient and family-centered care, the staff feel more, feel more satisfied about the, um, the care that they are provided and increasing compliance, reduce readmission and admission, reduce length of stay, uh, decrease waiting time, and so on. And also it improves safe, uh, safety, uh, such as reducing medical errors, reduced medications error, reduced patient falls, and so on. So these are just an example, a few examples of 
you know, how, how important or how beneficial it is to have patients and families in care. So why do we need culturally tailored uh, model? Um, because of different reasons. You know, the family you know, size is different from one society to others. In our uh, society, the family, the extended family is larger. Uh, the number of children is, um, is much bigger than the Western societies. And then you take it by that, you know, when, when we have a patient coming, sometimes you find the whole tribe with them coming to the emergency room. It's like, you know, the cousin and the uncle and so on, and you find uh, uh, and not unusual to have 20, 30 people coming with a patient to the ER. So, so the, there's a large extended family. There is um, strong social ties. Um, you know, there's religious factors. Um, so some of the people may view this as a religious duty to take care of the kins, kinship, and so on. And, uh, and visiting the patients is, uh, is also a religious duty. So you find, you know, people doing this out of religious a feeling, cultural factors, societal cultural factors. As I said, you know, there is this uh, feeling of connectivity even within uh, uh, the tribe. And sometimes somebody may not be even relative in blood to the patient, but yet have a very important contribution to the, to the decision uh, making. And then, of course, the healthcare culture is very uh, important. How the physician view the relation with the patients or the, the relation with the family and so on. And I'm going to give you an, a spectrum of how our healthcare culture, uh, you know, how our healthcare providers uh, interact with the families and get them involved. So that's the, actually the spectrum. I just tried to put it in a way that show you the range of um, of, of involvement. Here they are not involved at all, and here they are totally taking over the care of the patients. This is very important, you know, I mean, I sp we spend a lot of time on this because I can give you a lot of examples, and many of you from the region may relate to it, and some of it is even universal kind of thing. So, so not involved at all, it can be a decision of patients or a family choice. So the patient refused, to participate in the patient care or, or the, de the decision or even the communication, or the family refused. So they don't show, show up. So they may refuse. Clearly, they say, I have nothing to do with it, or they, they vote by, the, by their action. I mean, they drop the family members and they leave and you don't reach them. That's, that's they, they chose not to be involved in the patient care. So I have. For example, a son, these are all real-life real cases. A son dropped, for example, his sick mother in the emergency room and he's nowhere to be found. That's his choice not to, not to participate in the, uh, in the care of his mother. Uh, I, have a son, I have a patient who asked his family, he was very well educated, ex-military guy. He asked all his family to leave the room. He said, I want to have my own uh, uh, private time with my physician. Please, all of you leave. I want to discuss my condition with my physician alone. So this is either a family member. I could, I could break this into two uh, columns, if you will, but just for the sake of discussion now, here there is a decision by the family or the member not to get involved in the care. Okay, so now the other one, which is rather unusual, it's, it's the healthcare professional prevent the family from contributing it or overlook the family contribution uh, to the patient's care. So, so, and this happened frequently in different ways. So we, we walk into a patient room and, and then two scenarios could happen, or many scenarios, but I just want to mention the two contrast scenarios. So we walk to the patient's room and you say, hi, how are you doing? Uh, you know, how do you feel today? We are going to do blood tests, and so on and so on. And there's somebody there sitting, and nobody acknowledge him. Nobody say hi to him, as if he's fixed, you know, has his chair or something. We don't say, what if he's not relative? What if the patient does not want to hear, doesn't want him to hear? What if it's, you know, so we don't acknowledge. And, and, and this is, you know, in, in, in different setting. 
So we come and talk to the patients and we don't acknowledge the family member who is there. And the opposite side is we walk in and we talk to this powerful family member who took over the care and say, how are you, good morning, he is doing well. And you are talking about the patient in third person. He's doing well, we are going to do, we are going to give him blood today, he may go for endoscopy and so on, and you are talking over the patient. And the patient is there as if his bed sheet or something, I mean, something like, you know, is not existing. So, and we have to be careful about these things. So, so the healthcare provider is either uh, intentionally ignore the patient, unfortunately, or not intentionally, unintentionally ignore the patient and talk to the family, or the other way, ignore the family member and talk to the, to the patient himself. What triggered the cascade of, of uh, events about family involvement is actually a senior consultant was talking to a, a, a patient and he asked the wife to leave the room. He said, uh, please leave the room, I want to talk to my patients alone. Neither the patient asked him, nor, you know, uh, the, you know he, he feels that he wants to be with the patients alone and the wife has no right to be uh, in the room. So, of course, this uh, lady went, uh, complained to our leadership, who are very enlightened and, and well-educated and aware of, of, uh, of, of these issues, and, you know, then triggered the uh, uh, action of trying to develop this uh, family involvement model. Now, this, the second column is the participatory, which is the ideal one. It's a patient and healthcare provider choice. Both patients and the provider invite the family to participate. An issue discussed openly and the family uh, input was, is taken into account when making the decision. So this is the ideal situation, actually. Now, the other extreme of this is the family making fully the decision. And this can be in two types of, of scenarios. One is with the patient's approval, and one is with the, without the patient's approval. So with the patient's approval, the patients delegate, delegate the decision making to his brother, his hus her husband, his father, whatever, and then that person take care of the decisions. So that is patient's approval, and, and that's acceptable, I guess, in, in all societies almost. You know, so if I told you this is my, he's, my, he's going to decide on my behalf, and I have patients who tells me, who told me, examine me, do everything, ask me any question, but don't talk to me about, you know, specific about, you know, what you want to do, please talk to my brother, and I'll, he'll take his time and, and talk to me at home, or I don't have to know their certain specifics. It's rather unusual for, for some of us who from different society, you know, say why the patient does not want to hear. You know, some of our patients, and, and this is not just cancer patients, by the way, but some of the patients don't want to hear the word cancer. Some of them, they don't want to get into the details of, of making decision and understanding the, the details of their disease. They just want to say, do this, do that, and so on. And, and this is by their choice. Uh, and they may delegate making the major decision to somebody else. Now, with, uh, now, the other, the other scenario is when the family member make a decision without patient's approval. This is also two categories. One is the patient does not know about his disease, and the, the family, and, and this happens a lot in our field, the patients come before the father or the mother, and I say, my father doesn't know about the diagnosis. Please don't tell him he's getting chemo or something like this. And, you know, you know I, I don't think he should get chemo or something. So he tried to make a decision without the, the patient knowing. Or, or, or sometimes they make the decision against the, the you, you recommend something and the family vote, no, we don't want to do that here or we don't want to do that now or whatever. So these are things that we encounter uh, on a regular basis. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, actually I'm, as a chairman, one of the most uh, common complaints about my physician is that your consultant told, our, told my sick loved one about his diagnosis, which is supposed to be a common thing, right? But disclosing the diagnosis 
may upset the family in a big way. You say, you know, he, and, and they say the statement, unfortunately, he killed my husband when he told him about the diagnosis. After that, he just got destroyed emotionally. He would not eat, he would not, and he would, he killed him. They, they say that. And so, so that's why it's very uh, critical, you know, one has to get the family involved in breaking the news and prepare them. And, and this is a whole scope of work that, you know, require a lot of attention and a lot of uh, studies, you know, how we are going to change this. But, but we have an experience of a, an elderly lady was diagnosed with breast cancer. Every day the team is coming. Her, her sons or daughters, there's one of them guarding the door and he is reminding the team not to tell their mother that he is, that she has breast cancer. Say, please don't tell her because of her psychology, because of you know, her spirit, and don't break her spirit, and so on. So one day, the doctor came early, and he saw the door open, and this cute elderly lady called him, doctor, come, come. He came, and she said, please, if I have a breast, if I have a breast cancer, don't tell my kids. It's not good for their psychology and spirit, and so on. So, 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 so this is, you know, sometimes, you know, children may be overprotected, uh, and, or, or people may be overprotected, and the, the, the person knows more than what, he, what we think he knows. And one time I was breaking news to, she was asking direct question, you answer direct answer. And actually those two, two daughters who were outside the, the door bargaining with me not to break the news, they are the one who collapsed. So I was telling her, yeah, you have liver meds, because she asked specifically, and then the daughter who was telling me, don't tell her, it's not good for her. She is the one who collapsed. Uh, you know, so it's, it's rather very unusual dynamic. One has to keep this in mind. So let me give you a quick case study. That has also a lot of cultural flavor here. So Ms. Nof is a 46-year-old, and this is a true story. Uh, and the name is not true, or correct. So is a 46-year-old lady who was diagnosed with the stage 4 lung cancer. I gave her four lines of chemotherapy, and she, she is, now has no active uh, cancer treatment that is known to, to be efficacious. Started complaining of progressive shortness of breath and chest pain. So she was admitted for symptom uh, uh, management and uh, basically transitioned to palliative care for end-of-life care. So, husband, initially was heavily involved in the patient care, coming to her appointments, um, you know, you know, and, and be, you know, interested in, in this. Then when things dragged on a few months, a year, two years, he just started disappearing, and then apparently he married to another woman, and he came and told her point blank that he married another woman and he has another life going on. So then, but the last admission, and when she got too sick, he came back and turned around, came back, and he stuck with her side all the time and was taking care of her. Now, the two daughters felt upset, and he said, he's, you know, this, his, he has cruel behavior. He should not be involved in her care. All of a sudden, after four years, I have two brothers who are officers, very kind of uh, commendable guys coming, you know, with, you know, the military fo forms and uh, uniforms and, and saying, this is our sister, and we need to take care of her now. Please give us report. This man who is her husband supposed not to make a decision. Uh, you know, he doesn't care, and we are the one who is going to take care of her. Please give us a report so we can get a second opinion. So basically, there was a full-fledged fa family conflict. Uh, uh, you know, was the order of the day, as they say. So what to do? So. Who should be involved in the decision making here? Uh, who has the final say uh, in these decisions? Uh, and, and what about the rest of the family? What will be the roles? The decisions that we need to make here is the no code and the referral to palliative care. So here you know, comes the issue of the communication model. There are many, many stories, not all of them are second marriage and divorce and so on, but there are many stories of different family dynamics that comes to service, and, and that's true in all societies. Our staff feel overwhelmed 
Because a son comes and asks a question, how is my father? How is he doing today? And then all of a sudden the brother comes, then the youngest son comes and asks the same question. Then, you know, the, the driver of the seventh neighbor comes and asks, you know, what, how is, you know, my, the uncle of my friend is doing and so on. So it's, it's like, you know, the, so you get like 20 questions sometimes a day, especially in the first couple of days, and especially if cancer, because cancer still, uh, sends uh, chills in the bones of, the whole neighborhood, not just the, 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 the family, immediate family members. So, and, and I told you about the incidents that trigger the action about the physician asking the, and, and there, was, there was conflict and he insisted and he said, this is not your right, leave the room please, and so on. So, so there was task for, force formed to develop family-oriented care model and, and, you know, some of the committee charges was to identify service gaps in the family-oriented care. You know, I don't want to get into this family-oriented, the word oriented is old, now it's family-centered, patient-centered, you know, call it whatever you want. It's, it's just a matter of how to involve the family into the patient's care unit. That's the bottom line. Whatever you want to name it, that's fine. Sorry if the terminology doesn't appeal to, to everybody, but, you know, we need to have the family incorporated, family involvement incorporated into the patient's care somehow, in a structured way. So, so you know, as you know, there was, you know, the, the family-centered care, patients and family-centered care is an innovative approach of planning, delivery, and evaluation of healthcare that's grounded in partnership and collaboration between providers, patients, and, and the families. So, the core concepts are, you know, based on respect and dignity, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. So, now this is how it looks now. This is how the family, as you know, all our family members come in all shapes and forms and, <laughs> and personalities and so on. There is a square one, there is triangle one, there is different kind of shape, there is pinky one, there is dark black one, there's all colors in the families, right? So they come in all shapes and form. Some of them wants to talk over the patient in front of him, and some of them wants to talk behind the patients, and some of them, even sometimes, you know, we are to be blamed that even the consultants we bring sometimes may not communicate with us on certain issues. But it's all over the place. So, so... What we need to, to do is to make sure that we streamline this and make it in a structured way. So we thought about, in, in our system, there is something called the most responsible physicians. We thought of having a partner from the family call him the most responsible family member. So this may be different than the next of kin. It is appointed by the patient and live close to the patient that can, can provide continuity of care. And, he, and this most responsible family member should be identified clearly to all the family members and the staff member. They should know the most responsible family member is Mr. Ali, the oldest son of our patients. And this is his contact information. Everybody wants to talk to the family. This is their first line of communication with them. And then, you know, of course, you know, so he will be the, the liaison between the family and the healthcare system. But that doesn't replace totally 100% involvement of the family at certain settings, especially when there is a crisis and you need to have a family conference. So we need to move from this to this. So this is our proposed model, is to basically keep the patients in the center and, and this, this is done carefully, purposefully, you know, like having the patients a bit ahead, you know, here in this curve, that he is the front and center. We should not bypass him at all unless he asks otherwise. There is something in our system called sitter, as I said, it may not be a family member, but we have it in our care unit. So this blue is a sitter. So sometimes could be the housemaid, could be somebody you know, a neighbor, somebody who comes and have time to spend with the patients in the hospital. And then 
the one that we need to appoint is the yellow one, is the most responsible family member. And then we keep all the family around with a dotted line of communication. These arrows are the line of communication. The bold one is direct communication, direct structured communication. So, so we have the patient in the center with the most responsible family member and the most responsible physician and the care team in the center. And we bring other providers, consultant in the picture, but they will be always keeping the, the primary team in the picture and going through the primary care and, and keep them in the loop. So the bold one is the line of communication, the patient in the center and the physician, most responsible family member in the team. And if there is, we cannot make this zero. We cannot prevent other family member, members from involving, uh, getting involved or asking or covering or whatever, but at least we will minimize it and stream, streamline it. So basically this is what, uh, what is the, the framework and this is how the model should look in our mind. And when you do this one, you help people start thinking, even in our case and many other cases I will show you. I'll show you just one of the case study we are doing. You know, how you, you say, okay, wait a second, you guys, good, you know, you are very important family member, but get me somebody that we talk to, you know, and, and, and make it, uh, uh, you know, structure, uh, structure uh, communication, and I will show you how we implemented that. So then, okay, I know to whom to communicate. When and what should I communicate with? You know, and wh when you do tell me I'm complying with the communication, I'm good communicating, communicator with the family, and when do you say no? You are not doing a good job in, communication with, in, communica in communicating with the family. So we said there are mandatory points that healthcare providers should communicate with, with the family. And it's, it's really very disheartening sometimes. And let me give you an example. It's a, when you put a valuable thing at the repair, repair uh, center, you put your smartphone or your computer or your fancy car or whatever. What they will do, they will, when they take it, they will say, we are going to take it in and check it for you, do this, 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 this for it, in terms of checking. So when, you are, when, you are take, when they are taking valuable things, and it's materialistic things, not as valuable as a patient, they describe it. And then when they want to do something with it and they find an error, they call you and tell you, we find this need to be changed. Is it okay to change? When, when there's something major they found and, and the, the, the condition totally changed from the previous talk, they will call you say, well, your car is not fixable, your phone is not fixable, you know, or whatever. So even for little, little things, you know, other people communicate better than us. To, to, to the customers. So we said when you get the patient in, you tell them about the admission, you tell them about the general care of, uh, plan, of, uh, plan of care, and we are going to give them. So when, when they give you your valuable things, they tell you, here is your car, here is your phone, and we did this, 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 too. this is the itemized things we did for, for them, and so on. So when, when patients come in, they need to know, and when they are discharged, they need to be involved in the discharge planning. When you are going to do procedure, when uh, you know there is a significant change in the patient condition, deteriorate, he goes to the ICU. When you want to make a no code or withdrawal of support, and then if the family requested and there is a pressing issue that you need to um, to have a larger family conference. Now the summary of the model is that the patient remained in the center. We brought the most responsible family member. We have communication plan and, and communication points that we can assess whether the physician is communicating or the healthcare providers or physician or nurse or other, but you know, you know, here we are focusing on the MRB, making sure that the, because the nurses are much better communicators than the, than the physicians and they have more time with the patients. But the physician comes for 10, 15 minutes a day and he moves on. So, you know, we, we, it's very important that the point of care communication is measuring the, patient, the physician involvement in the communication with the family. And we realize that there is a lot of education needed. 
to, uh, and education needed uh, to all the staff and so on. So coming back to our case, this is, this is the patient. She has two daughters that communicating with her, they are teenagers, by the way, 16 and 17, rarely communicate with the physician, but we hear about their opinion from the nurses and so on. And, and you know, so, you know, then these are the two brothers who don't communicate with the husband and they want to take over. And here's the husband and, and then here's the palliative care. They were in limbo. Sorry, there's an arrow here, of course. But there is the palliative care did not know to come or not to come because the husband opposed, opposed them coming. So, so then, then this is how it looks now. And again, there's an arrow between the husband and the MRB uh, team. So what did we do? We asked the patient. Of course, you know, this is, but believe it or not, many people struggle, many people struggle for with this simple concept. Go to the patient and ask them. And, and do you feel that uh, the provider is overwhelmed what to do? And the solution is just, you want a spokesman for the family, right? Okay. You want a spokesman. Okay. The one who appoints the spokesman is the patient. Very simple concept. You go to the patient, tell me who is your spokesman. And you, you don't believe it sometimes family conflict with healthcare provider goes on for weeks and, and, uh, or days and weeks sometimes and escalate and you know, and uh, if you come and tell him, look, sorry, the, the, our, our approach to this is like this. The patient will tell us who is going to talk. You know, if he did not appoint you, it's not your responsibility. So guess, guess whom did the wife, whom did the patient choose? So she has the two brothers, the two daughters, and the husband who betrayed her and marry and left her for two, three years and come back. Whom did she say will be her? Huh? The husband? Uh, why, why, you, why you say the husband? The guy married another woman and left her for a couple of years. And now he's coming to say, I'm, I'm, I'm here. The husband, who votes for other people? Who votes for the brothers? They are officers, really. They are good, strong. And, uh, huh? Who said the brothers? Nobody? Okay. Well, she said my husband. <laughs> so, so she said, and because she was struggling with the breathing, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, or with, so we, start, we have to sedate her, give her. So she said, he makes the decision even when I'm not able to. So she delegated making, because we, we knew we need, because I, was, I knew that two, three days later she will not be able to make the decision. And then the brother said, well, now she is comatose, we need to take over. So we told her, is he going to make the decision all along? It was clear, the team is there. This, she said, yes, he's going to make the decision all along. So now the brothers, the daughters, okay, their opinion is important, but it's an opinion now. It's not a mandate, it's not a patient wishes which is very important for us. So, so I told her, what about your daughters and your brothers? He said, involve them, please. Tell them, don't hide anything from them. But when there's a conflict, take my husband's opinion. So she doesn't want to hide any information, want them to be in the picture, but not making decision. So we need, this is now the patient's model. If you notice here, the husband, the most responsible family member now, came the circle or the oval came ahead of the patient. So the patient now get inside because he's making the decision now. And he was the sitter. So if you notice, there was a sitter here by uh, oval that is gone because he is acting now as the most responsible family member as the sitter and the decision maker. And here in the green, we keep the daughters and the, and, and the brothers and so on, whoever else. Now, we kept the palliative care team not in the front. We did not transfer her to the patient, uh, to the palliative care because the husband said yes to no code, but I want her to stay under oncology. I don't want her to move to palliative care. So we kept palliative care as a, uh, as a consultative service. And, uh, you know, and, you know we, we took care of her with them. And I, I remained the primary, uh, the primary physician. <coughs> so... The family members, we involved them in her case, received symptom management, 
in the final hours of her life, she started getting hypotensive. The brothers get stressed and restless, and they said, somebody told us she has fluid around her heart. Please get somebody to, to take the fluid out. We said, you know, this is not going to help. This is a terminal disease. So again, we went back to the husband. He said, it's okay to get consultation, but please don't do any procedure. So we got the cardiologist, and the cardiologist said, this is not related to tamponade, it's not tamponading, and you know, there's no indication for the drainage. And we left her alone, and the patient expired peacefully a few hours later. Her husband and her brothers were beside her, and it was quiet, serene, uh, serene atmosphere uh, that, you know, end up in a peaceful way, basically. So, now, coming to, implemented, to implement this model at a larger scale, uh, you know, we had a hospital-wide project, and this is uh, the project profile where we put the model, uh, the, the uh, name of the project, the measures that we are looking for, what is the definition, the source of data, and so on. And basically, we need to see uh, how the people will comply with uh, the most responsible family, uh, family member uh, utilization, appointment, and so on and so forth. So the project aim was to implement a communication model that assures systematic involvement of uh, families in patient care. And we wanted to start in the emergency room, then spread to other parts of the hospital. We did process mapping. Uh, we did observe uh, the patient's registration process, because we have something called documentation of the next of kin. And you can tell that this was broken uh, a process, because even our quality improvement person who, was, who brought somebody with wheelchair to the registration desk, they took his number as next of kin. So whoever comes with a patient, you know, they just appoint him as next of kin. You know, they just want to fill the forms and move on. And we assess the nursing awareness of family involvement. Look at this very interesting survey. So we did look at, we asked 41 nurses on specific patients. A third patient, in room, uh, this patient in this room, Mr. Ali, and so on. Um, do you know whether he has family with him or not? Do you know whom to talk from the family uh, members? And actually, almost 50% of them did not know their family members of the nurses. And the majority did, did not know if they want to talk to a family member to whom to talk to. You know, 80% of them. What happened is that the patient with the family come for registration, they register and so on, and, and they get the patient into the room, and then sometimes the family goes to the waiting area. So now the nurse who is taking care of the patient, or the next shift nurse maybe, doesn't know whether the patient has family or not, because she did not see them when they come. So at least 50% of the nurses did not know whether there is a family around this patient or not, and majority did not know which, who is the most responsible family member. Now when we asked the patients, we asked the oriented patients, 33 of them, because the other eight were disoriented, 100% know who is the most responsible family member. And 96%, they said, yes, we have a family members with us here in the ER. So you can see this discrepancy. There is a, there is a break of the awareness of the um, staff about the presence of the family uh, around the patients. So, so we did uh, this uh, kind of flow of how we are going to approach this. And we said, if the patient is alert, oriented, he appoints them the most uh, responsible family member. We had a form called Form A, I'll, I'll show it to you briefly. If he's disoriented and he comes with a family member, we, we see is he in the next of kin or not, because there is a legal implication to that. So we have a list who should be the next of kin by hierarchy if the patient cannot make a decision, because we have to abide by the law. Uh, if the patient is comatose and you have 10 people in the room, on which basis you are going to select which one to be the, uh, the responsible person. You go by the law, the father, for example, and, and so on. So we have, we have this. So we ask the next of kin. If he accepts, we appoint him as the, we say you are now, till the patients get awake or get better, you are the one who will be talking to you as the family liaison, the most responsible family member. If he doesn't accept, we look for down the list of the next of kins till somebody accepts. If he doesn't have a family member, 
we try to reach them. If we reach them by phone, we get it. If not, no response. We have a social service involved, and every day they will keep looking for a most responsible family member. And uh, we are saying it to avoid the next of kin because next of kin is a, is a specific definition. The most responsible family member may not be the next of kin by definition. So <clears throat> we did uh, rapid uh, cycles of testing changes. 15 BDSAs were done. One to, to evaluate how the staff registered the, uh, the, the next of kin. We have done four BDSAs to see how the patients and family and staff accept the most responsible family member concept. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, other eight BDSAs to, to, to test and modify the forms and so on. Um, and then, you know, to track the documentation. So, so these are basically, as I said, you know, now we have, you know, we even, during the process, we said, when are we going to renew this reappointment of the most responsible family members. And we decided also, when do we need to do that? Uh, for example, any admission, we asked the patient, do you still need to keep the most responsible family member or you want to change it? When we are uh, you know, renewing the eligibility cards or if the patient requested this. Uh, so. So now I'm going to share with you in the remaining few minutes the lessons learned and, and you know, the issues that came and where are we going from. So the, of, where, from here, the patient's concern. So you can imagine, you know, when you are saying I'm going to appoint somebody, uh, you know, need you to appoint somebody from your family to, to talk to him, all of a sudden start worrying. What is the legal aspect of that? Is he going to be legally responsible for all the financial things? Is he going to go uh, take the house and take the car and take and write them in the court with his name? So we, we ease this right away by telling him, is telling the patient that he is going to make decision in the hospital by your permission if you are and things related to your health care within the hospital system. Um, and people worried about being able to change, we say, you can change it anytime. You can change it every day if you want, every hour. You can cancel it so you feel comfortable. This is your decision. Somebody comes and say, I want to have my oldest son, but my youngest son is nice too. Can we put two most responsible family members? So we explain, say, you know, this defeats the purpose of having a single line of communication that is, you know, streamlining the communication, and, and people accept it. We encounter the altered mental status, and we overcome that by having the forms I told you about. Um, and I've told you about the next of kin. And then we realized that we need education material quickly. From the first uh, uh, PDSA, we realized that we need to have something in writing uh, easy to explain to the patients. So we developed this telling the patient what, who is the most responsible family member and what is their responsibility. Uh, but in details, in a simple one-page bilingual um, form. So that's, the, that's from the patient side. The family became, some of the family member became concerned, but doctor, if you appointed somebody, you know, all the rest of the family is going to be unsighted, uh, on the line, uh, on the sideline, and so we, we ease up that by telling them, you know, please, you know, we need to make sure that you, you know, he is going to be your representative. You can talk to him, and, and if there is issues, we can always bring it back to the patients. And fortunately, we did not have really, we, ha we have hundreds of uh, examples that, you know, things went very smoothly. Uh, you know, sometimes we may have most responsible family member that we cannot reach. So we develop a system calling an emergency contact number as a backup. Uh, in case we could not reach the most responsible family member. We trained 250 nurses and 20 registration staff in the emergency department. Um, they train how to, to appoint the most responsible family members and uh, how to communicate with the uh, medical staff about it and show them the communication form uh, to, to log in you know, any communication that happened with the patients. And we did uh, a reach out for the physicians and we did education sessions for all the physicians in the ER. 
developed two tools, as I said, one for uh, alert, able to make a decision patients, and one for minors and unable to make a decision. And, and it has specific uh, um, steps for each one of them and the tracking form. So, for example, this is form A. The patient is able to make a decision. We tell them, we tell them what is the, the responsibility of the most responsible family uh, member. And then they put their names and phone number and uh, mobile and, uh, and then they sign. And then the patient signed that he appointed this person as most responsible family member. And then one of the team members, the one who's filling the form, the registration person, also sign it. If the patient refused to say, I don't want to appoint uh, somebody now, then he, we check here that we offered him and he refused. So we document that. Now, if he's, com if he's comatose, unable to make a decision, and let's say the registration uh, staff has 10 in the waiting room, he says, who is that with Mr. Swan? So all of a sudden, 10 hands raised. So he goes by asking, starting by this, if there is a legal guardian, husband, wife, father, mother, he goes by sequence. So he say, if there is, has, if she's a female, is a husband here? Husband there, he takes him. But this is by the law. Uh, if, uh, if it's a man, he say, is wife here? If the wife is there, he takes the wife as, as most responsible. Because this is how they consenting and the next of kin flow goes. Okay? So then, 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 then we sign. And here the communication uh, log where, you know, the mandatory points are here and then other things, you know, and, you know, they sign every time they communicate with the patients, they sign here, what did they do, and, and so on. We had an auditing tool, uh, you know, for compliance with the forms and compliance with the appointment of most responsible family member or the communication or the docu documentation of communication form, and I'll show you some of the results. We spread this throughout the emergency department. We spread it to one ICU and then the adult oncology uh, uh, ward. So these are some of the results of com compliance with the completion of the forms. And you, you can see that, you know, you know when there's learning, uh, you know, the curve, the, you know, it goes up to high. Then when we add the new units and so on, it goes down, then, you know, it picks up and, you know, it, it reaches up, upper 90s. But this is, again, because this is our hard copies paper. And so there'll be a lot of things that, as you can imagine, with, with this uh, hard copies, uh, paper, paper forms, and so on. So now we get the feedback from the nurses and from uh, the patients about the impact of having most responsible family member. And all the patients were happy, actually, that, that we survey, and the majority of the nurses were happy. There was some concern because of language barrier between the nurses and the the patients, you know, as you know, majority of our nurses are non-Arabic speaking nurses. But that's why we put the registration staff who are all Arabic speaking people to appoint the most responsible family member. So now we come to sustainability. We find, so the, in summary, we find that this is very acceptable to the patients and the family. And this is, you know, hundreds of, of instances. We learn, we know how the patients think. We know all the concerns that they came up, we try to cover it, we train our staff right away how to answer the patients and ease his concern. So we find acceptability by the patients great, acceptability by the staff good. So, so now we said, uh, you know, we need to make, this, to make this sustainable, we need to incorporate it into the system and, uh, and you know, we need to make it an automated uh, process. So that the uh, goal is to make this automated process and disseminate it through uh, the National Guard uh, services within Central Region and other region. And there will be, we are going to participate in a third way of improvement projects. So this we try to develop the framework because now we are moving to a new electronic system. By next month, we will have this new electronic system and we start developing the computer frames to these most responsible family members. And, uh, and you know, these are some of the frames. I'm not going to um, 
you know, waste your time with the technical parts, but basically uh, incorporating all what we learned, uh, you know, into electronic uh, uh, format that, you know, w once we implement it, we are, of course, going to do another wave of, uh, of uh, PDSAs to see how the electronic system will, would work. But the most important barrier, I think, uh, we, we overcome it by understanding how the patients think, how the family thinks, how the staff think. So now it's a matter of, you know, so there's acceptance, wide acceptance. We know all the, the ch well, not all, we know majority of the challenges that, you know, comes in, in, in this process. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll uh, when we incorporate it into the electronic system, we can audit it better. And, you know, it can be something that, you know, like for example, if the patient was comatose and we could not reach a most responsible family member, there will be a pop-up screen, appoint most responsible family member or reminder, patient does not have most responsible family member and so on. And, and then, you know, if even the staff, regist the registration staff forgot to do it or did not do it, there will be a memo coming or uh, because it's electronic now to the social service saying this patient does not have most responsible family member and so on. And, and you know, you know, the, the electronic medical records has, has its own challenges, of course, but it has a lot of blessing and pluses. Uh, one of it is, you know, uh, good auditing tool trying to catch a, catch a accurate result more than paper um, auditing uh, methodology. And this is our team, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry for my voice. I just woke up like this, and I did not sing opera last night. I don't know what happened to my voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. We may have time for one question. Is there anyone who has a question, folks? Yes, Yanni. <coughs> Jan Lehmann Knudsen from Denmark and my daily living uh, quality director of the Cancer Society. Thank you very much. And at first, uh, it's actually most an appreciation of you taking this, uh, giving this, uh, uh, this talk. I, I think it's so important that you, you create knowledge about what, what, what does actually patient and family want? How do they want to be involved in, in decision making? Thank you very much. I, and I want just to say that in the, I'm on the board of eSquare and, and eSquare have, have uh, defined uh, person-centered care as a st strategic area of the next coming years and we have established a, a patient uh, you know, uh, advisory group with representatives from different parts of the world in order to, to, uh, to share common principles and values, but also to clarify where are we, where are we different and why are we different and, and how can we learn from each other. So an invitation for joining that would be, uh, I, I would like pleasure. to give you, but, but also to, uh, from the cancers, from where I work, we, we carry out national surveys among cancer patients and we got respondents from 4,500, and we ask the patient about their preferences for decision making. And it's a different system and different population than yours, but actually the patient, we were surprised that also in, in oncology, patient, they, 80%, no, 90% of the patient, they want to, to be informed by the physician, they want to, to, to to, to be part of the decision decision making process themselves, yes. and only a very few percent wanted the the, the uh, doctor to take the final decision, and it was a surprise for for the medical uh, society that the that the number of patients actually so many patients want to be involved themselves in the decision making process, and we know that that involving the patient also in will reduce the, the, the degree of inter intervention because patients want have, have different prefer uh, preferences. So it's a, it's a big thing, and, and, and if you have more data, I would love to have them. Uh, I, would, I would love to share that with you. And, you know, it's very critical that we involve the patients because many times, you know, that will make our, our life and our job easier, but most importantly, give us satisfaction that we are delivering what 
you know, what the patients want, not in the end. Yeah, so, you know, you know this one time we sit around with the team, we have a diagnosis, we say this patient is good for cis tax, uh, cis uh, carbotaxol. And then you walk and you say, no, doctor, I'm not going to take anything. Thank you. You know, and so it's a very important issue. And, and that's true about every other disease too. And, uh, you know, with the social media, with the changing, the rapidly changing societies, this is going to be expectation across the board, across the world. Thank you. And, and the problem is going to be difficult, as, as, as diverse as, you know, because we are different human beings and everybody reacts differently. So no matter how much you make models and structure and so on, you should always be flexible to incorporate individual needs uh, and, and, and uh, but particularity and peculiarity of, of peoples. Thank you. Thank you for your most appropriate question and contribution, Yanni, and thank you very much, Dr. Daisy. Great way to finish the conference and uh, an amazing contribution. Thank you. Thank you.